Hey, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together, we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott, and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to the survival of humanity, which is to say, to making conscious evolution a possibility, or even a probability. In this second series, we've been branching out to find people who have been using these tools, or some like them, people who have been diving deep into the areas that will help us get to where we need to go. And today, for the first time, I'm talking to somebody else who is also exploring conscious evolution, who is trying to find the ways that we can bring all of us into a world where we have greater meaning, where each of us has a life of agency and purpose and creativity and connection, where we know what we're here for and where we want to go. Rob Cobbold is the founding editor of a website called Conscious Evolution. The address will be on the show notes. There's a blog there, and he's about to launch a podcast. Rob has a BA in English Literature from Bristol University and is midway through a Master's in Sustainable Leadership from Cumbria University, which is the home of Jem Bendel, the author of the Deep Adaptation paper. Rob works as Programme Manager for the Green Schools Project and has spent the past three years giving assemblies and workshops in schools with the aim of inspiring and equipping young people to take action on climate change and other social issues, with a view to bringing all of us towards conscious evolution. So here today, people of the podcast, please welcome Rob Cobbold. Rob Cobbold, thank you so much for coming on to Accidental Gods podcast. Welcome. We're at the, I think, middle of the third week now of UK lockdown, pretty much lockdown around the world. You're in London. How is it going in London? No, no, I'm not in London. <laughs> You're not? Oh, I'm, that's good. <laughs> I know, I fled. Um, I went to my mum's house to stay in the countryside. And, Very wise. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's actually so dreamy and um, lovely here in springtime. I, I feel almost guilty we're having such a nice time. Um, I'm aware yeah. that, you know, it's a very difficult moment for all sorts of people for various reasons. Um but, you know, we've been so incredibly lucky. Um, we're, we're sitting out in our garden. We've got ducks on the pond. The flowers are coming out. And I've had tons of time to, to work on, on my podcast and Conscious Evolution. And, yeah, we've been cooking nice food. I mean, it's, every time I speak to someone and they say, oh, it's terrible, this isolation, I feel almost guilty telling them what a nice time I'm having. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, of course, you have to balance that with the, you know, the, the, it's, it's difficult times for lots of people, of course. Yes, and I've been having so many conversations recently along the that balance of guilt and awareness and awareness of our own privilege, those of us who mm. are not on the 10th floor of a tower block with somebody who is sexually abusing us daily because they've got nothing better to do. Um, right. So so clearly the world is, is not easy for a lot of people, but for those of us for whom it is, I think for me at the moment the best thing I can do is to pour my gratitude out into the world and at least add something positive on that side of the balance against all of the people who are having a really shit time. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, w- w- with with that privilege, what are you going to do with that, you know? Um, and so, yeah. yeah, like you, I've been using my time as much as I can to try and, um, well, do do what I think I'm here to do and, and to, you know, provide people with a um, a larger narrative or story um, about why life is meaningful, because... If you have that, then, you know, the difficult stuff in life becomes bearable. Yes, yes. And it's so encouraging to to hear you say that. So let's do a little bit, take a step back. I found you because you have a website called consciousevolution.co.uk. I didn't find you until after we'd launched Accidental Gods, which is probably just as well. And you <laughs> were away, um, you were away in Eastern Europe, I think, when we first contacted. And now you're home. And it would be good, I think, if you could explain to everybody, first of all, what your website is about, and second, how you came to the concept of conscious evolution and what its history is for you. Hmm. So 
my key influence is a an Australian uh, evolutionary theorist called John Stewart. I found his evolutionary manifesto online uh, at a very um, fragile moment, I suppose, in my life, um, where I was going through a lot of change and I was looking for answers. And it, it hit me like a like a meteorite. It, it just, I immediately knew I was looking at, you know, what I'd been searching for. And um, that sort of kindled in me a desire to spread that message, to, to, um, to be part of the changes that he envisioned. And off the back of that, um, yeah, I started doing a lot more research. Um, quite a lot of uh, the thinkers that I came across, John pointed me to. He was very kind in, you know, taking me under his wing to a certain extent. And, you know, and, and through that process, I found um, Integral Theory and Ken Wilber and uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard, who's one of the first people to use the term conscious evolution. Um, but I think yeah, above all, what I discovered from that process is that you can understand the concept of con conscious evolution from a spiritual perspective um, through a very kind of intuitive, um, heart-led um, kind of way, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a kind of a process of spiritual growth. Um, but equally, um, if you're more like Jon Stewart um, and you're very um, hard-headed and even, even a materialist, it's quite possible to understand um, the idea of conscious evolution from a scientific, um, very rational perspective. And that's what really appealed to me is that there is this obvious schism in the world um, uh, between, you know, those two, broadly, those two perspectives, the more spiritual perspective, the more scientific perspective. And if we're going to move forward at all, we're going to have to integrate those two perspectives. Um, and conscious evolution and um, the entire sort of evolutionary journey seems to be that nexus where those two points connect. Um, and so, th so I launched my website and I've been recording a podcast as well, which is just about to come out um, to try and spread that, spread that message. So because we have very much been looking at the, the spiritual aspects on accidental gods, could you walk us through the materialist argument for conscious evolution as John Stewart proposes it. Yeah, absolutely. So if we are to take a step back and define what evolution is, for a long time, the concept of evolution has just been about biological gene-based evolution. That's the layman's understanding of evolution. Um, but if you, if you take a step back, and I don't mind what you call it, I call it evolution, but there is a process whereby a cloud of hydrogen gas becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and humans, as Brian Swim <laughs> yes. famously yes. said. So whatever you want to call that, there is a process. And is it possible to think about that entire process or define that entire process, which is consistent throughout all those levels, throughout the cosmological, biological, and cultural evolutionary stages? Um, can we define that process in a way that's consistent throughout all those levels? And it turns out we can. Um, and it turns out that through those two, through those, you know, three levels of evolution, um, there are two trajectories. The first trajectory is that scales of cooperation, the scales of cooperation increase. So life and the matter in life finds ways of organising itself into cooperatives of larger and larger scale. So are we talking about symbiotic relationships or at a sort of at a mycorrhizal level and then at the more organism level? Or are you talking about, tell, tell us what that means. So at, at all levels. So um, in the physical world, you know, atoms um, combine to form molecules, um, and actually, something interesting I learned the other day, that it took 380,000 years for the first atom to form, which is, I just find absolutely mind-blowing. That's a very that. small amount of, in, in the billions, 13.4 billion years of evolution, 380,000 is a blink. Yeah, I suppose so. But it's just, I just find it interesting to imagine this world of uh, literally just a load of electrons flying around. There weren't even any atoms before that point. And so hang on, hold on, just walk me back through, when there's a cloud of electrons... 
how do we get a proton and a neutron? I, I'm, you'll have to ask a, a particle physicist, I'm afraid. I don't know. Okay. All right. I wish I'll do. That's a future podcast. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> but somehow, yeah, atoms formed. Um, at some point, atoms combined to form molecules, molecules, um, you know, and so, in, in, and then, you know, stars formed, um, stars produced planets. Um, so there, was, there is this trajectory of life going from the microscopic, the very infinitely limited finite forms, organizing itself into more and more complex arrangements, um, at which at some point, life emerged. And life repeated that same trajectory. So life began as um, very, very, just, just basic combinations of uh, molecular processes um, that literally started cooperating together to form um, um, something that could replicate itself. And so literally the emergence of life, the best theory we have is that a load of molecular processes came together to cooperate to form a self-replicating um, piece of uh, genetic material. Um, and so from its inception, life has been an inherently cooperative activity. Um, and those simple cells, those uh, prokaryotic cells, they combine together to form eukaryotic cells. Uh, eukaryotic cells combine to form multicellular organisms. Um, and then you get uh, the emergence of cooperatives of multicellular organisms like shoals of fish, beehives, um, and eventually humans. And indeed, in human history, the same process repeats itself. We go from small bands to tribes to uh, city states to nation states, etc. So that's one trajectory. Um, and it's also important to say that that trajectory has been driven uh, just by the logic of, um, by the kind of inexorable process of physical laws um, and uh, and natural selection. Um, all of that, all of that, took place um, or can be understood to have taken place blindly, unconsciously, um, just through. Um, uh, the process of natural selection and the physical laws as we know them. Are you familiar with, with Greg Baden's theories around gene two at all in terms of that? No. Okay. Um, it's probably a rabbit hole we don't need to go down just now. Um, and I will try and create that in another podcast. But anyway, let's let that one go for the moment. Okay. So, yeah. So the, the, the point that I'm getting at is that, you know, all that process of um, increasing scales of cooperation happened in a kind of automatic bottom-up fashion. So... Two tribes cooperated together to form a larger tribe uh, because it was in their interest to do so. Nothing is more likely to bring two tribes together than the arrival of an even larger tribe on the other side of the mountain. Yeah, And the, the tribes that didn't do that, that didn't cooperate to form larger tribes, they were likely to get competed out and outselected. Or killed, as we call it. Right, exactly. And simply because the potential is always there for a larger cooperative to outcompete a smaller, a smaller isolated structure. Okay. When we reach the global level, which we are now, we're trying to form the emergence of a global cooperative to go from nations to a global cooperative. Um, there is no longer any out group to compete against. That was my next question. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so what has worked in the past won't continue to work in the future. So I'll just park that there. The second evolutionary trajectory is increasing evolvability. So um, the evolutionary process itself gets better at evolving. Um, and there are a series of transitions where that occurs. So one transition is the emergence of life. Um, biological life has a degree of freedom and agency that uh, the material world doesn't have. It's, it's less predictable. It's less mechanistic. Um, so, you know, if you take a rock and you place it at the top of the hill... Uh, using just the physical laws um, of gravity, uh, the understanding of the friction of the slope, etc., we can predict exactly where that rock is going to end up. Mm. Um, if you put a hedgehog at the top of the hill, <laughs> uh, we can't do that anymore, yep. right? Yep. It, it might roll downhill, but it might also catch sight of a nice-looking female hedgehog and decide to bimble uphill. Yep. Um, so there's a degree of freedom and agency that comes with the emergence of life that isn't in the physical universe. Um, and even single-celled organisms... The most powerful computer in the world cannot predict exactly how a single-celled organism is going to move. So there's a degree of freedom from determinism that emerges with the emergence of life. Yeah. Then that launches the biological evolutionary process. Um, and during that, we have various transitions where the biological evolution gets better at evolving. So the transition from asexual to sexual reproduction, for example, is a transition where... Um, 
the ev- the biological evolutionary process gets more efficient and more effective at evolving. Um, the, the, the foot goes down on the accelerator a bit. Yeah. Um, so that's one example. Uh, the, the dawn of cultural evolution is the latest evolutionary transition in which the process of evolution got better at evolving. Say so, say something more about that. Yeah, so cultural evolution is um, the variation and selection of memes, of ideas, as opposed to genetic material. So once the cultural evolutionary process was launched, humans had a way of spreading adaptive information um, without having to wait for the slow, painful process of genetic mutations um, and change through generations. Um, so if I discover a new adaptive behavior, whether it's uh, a new item of clothing, whether it's um, the printing press, whether it's um, a new cure, um, I can write that information down. I can spread that around the world. And that allows me that allows me to spread that adaptive information horizontally from organism to organism. So we can learn from each other during our lives and we can accumulate that information in the form of culture. Um, and that basically means that the evolutionary process can happen a lot faster. Hang on, what, the, the cultural evolutionary process, the the kind of social evolution, can happen faster. Uh, yes, well, it can happen at all. Yes, yes. exactly. Okay. Um, but but the the evolutionary process, as I've defined it, which is basically an increase in orderly complexity, okay, uh, which leads in the direction of emergent properties. That process accelerates with the with the dawn of cultural evolution. Okay. Yep. Um, because we can build structures of complexity and emergence much more quickly than biological evolution can. So, just one quick example. Um, it took millions upon millions of years for um, you know dinosaurs and birds to um, evolve through biological evolution, the mechanism for flight. Yep. Um, whereas humans, with the birth of cultural evolution, um, in a few, ten, few tens of thousands of years, we developed the ability for manned flight um, through the process of cultural evolution. Yep. So it's many, many times faster um, and it's many, many times more efficient and more effective at discovering successful adaptions. Yep. So that takes us up to this point where we have cultural evolution, um, but in a large part that cultural evolution is blind. So what I mean by that, a lot of our cultural evolution is driven by our evolutionary past. It's pushed by our evolutionary past. So a great deal of human culture is set up in order to allow us to pursue goals which are encoded in our genetic material. So we have an instinct and a drive to accumulate possessions, to um, uh, engage in tribal behaviours, to uh, seek sugar, because all of these behaviours were very useful in a hunter-gatherer context. Um, They helped promote the survival and reproduction of our genes. However, with cultural evolution and the exponential uh, explosive increase in the technological power that we have, a lot of those behaviours become uh, maladaptive at best or self-terminating at worst. So, for example, the drive to eat sugar, um, in our ancestral context, there was never enough sugar. Um, And so that was a very useful instinct. It meant if you found a gooseberry bush, you stuffed your face full of gooseberries, which is good. It helps you survive. But in a context where we can develop, you know, super processed sugar and Haribo sweets, that instinct, that drive is maladaptive. It's not doing the job that it's supposed to be doing. And it's not actually helping us survive and reproduce. Um, So that's just one small example. But we can say the same thing about our moral predispositions, our ethical predispositions, um, even our emotions, emotions like anger, for example, very useful if you're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, not great if you're stuck in traffic um, in the Birmingham roundabout, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, so much of our behavior in that sense is maladaptive um, and it's actively reducing our chances of survival as a species. And so we need to find a way, and this is what conscious evolution is in its in its in its more sort of if you understand it in a material way, um, it's the ability to not be dictated to by our biological and cultural programming of our evolutionary past. Yep. It's the ability to look at our instincts and the way we've been wired because of our evolutionary past, and make a conscious decision about how we're going to act in the future. And when we do that, evolution goes from being 
a push process, a bottom-up process, to a pull process. Because we start to imagine a better future and design our individual and collective behavior in such a way that we can evolve to that future. So evolution stops being pushed by pain and problems and uh, negative feedback. Um, and it starts to become a process which is driven by our visions of a better future. Um, and, and that capacity to do that, that new evolutionary capacity, which is you know, latent in our potential, we have the potential to do this, um, that has, is made possible by a combination between our self-awareness and our understanding of the evolutionary process. So to break that down a little bit more, if you think about what, from an evolutionary point of view, what is the value of self-awareness? Well, self-awareness, self-consciousness, which on this planet, as far as we know, humans are the only organism that has that capacity, it allows us to not be stuck in automatic behavior. Um, so if you speak to any um, sort of life coach or you know psychologist, if you want to change your habits and patterns of behavior, you need to become aware of them. Yeah. So, um, like, for example, in coronavirus, we're told not to touch our face so much. Well, it turns out this is something we do unconsciously all day long, yeah. as we do a great variety of our behaviors are super unconscious. I used to do uh, Alexander Technique. And Alexander, yeah, you're familiar yes, with it? Yes, totally. It's, it, it's incredible because it, it's basically just a process of using your body in the way it was designed to be used. But it turns out to get yourself to sit down or stand up or walk in a slightly different way takes extraordinary amounts of self-awareness. Mm. I, I, it was incredibly difficult for me to just sit down or stand up in a different way because we do these processes in a, such an unconscious way. They're so automatic. They're so unconscious. And so in order to actually change our behavior and, and author our behavior, we need to become um, self-aware. So... That's one part of the puzzle. Um, the second part of the puzzle that we require for conscious evolution is we need to have an understanding of the evolutionary process which gave birth to us. So when we developed a theory of our own evolution, the evolutionary process became conscious of itself. Yep. And in the same way that as an individual, if you are self-aware, it allows you to not be stuck in automatic behavior, the same goes for the evolutionary process at large. The moment the evolutionary process became aware of itself, it allowed it to gain a measure of autonomy about how it proceeds and in what direction it goes. And through understanding the evolutionary trajectories and the evolutionary journey that we've been on, uh, we can start to, to a certain extent, not entirely, but to a certain extent, we can start to steer and direct that process in such a way that those trajectories can be allowed to continue rather than coming, um, you know, crashing to a juddering halt in a mass extinction. Um, so that's what conscious evolution is from a sort of material perspective. It's a new evolutionary capacity. It's a leap forward in evolvability. Um, and humans have the potential to bring about this evolutionary transition. Um, but it's by no means guaranteed. Okay, so thank you. That's really comprehensive. And it opens up so many possible doorways. So let's look at, it's not guaranteed, it opens up the potential. Barbara Marx Hubbard started writing about this towards the end of the last millennium and John Stewart published his manifesto, I think in 2008. In your studies of this, have you any sense of anybody within this field having a time scale that they think is plausible? In terms of, okay, so let me expand that question a bit more. It seems to me that that deep adaptation is a thing, that we are heading very rapidly towards the potential of crashing into extinction, not just for ourselves, but taking quite a large amount of the biosphere with us in in any of the potential ways that we could do it. And so we are possibly more up against a hard time limit than certainly Barbara Marx Hubbard was aware of when she first wrote Conscious Evolution, although by the, the second iteration, clearly it was more obvious. And so it seems to me it's more urgent. And I'm wondering, first of all, are you seeing or is anybody seeing 
an increase in possibility and probability within this and how is that manifesting? And if not, is there a way that we can, from the worldviews of John Stewart and the others, increase the probability of making the emergence to a new reality as opposed to crashing into extinction? Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, yes, I absolutely believe that we will make it. Um, I'm an optimist by nature. Mm. Um, and, and as to the question of when or how long will this take? Well, the answer is it's happening now. Okay. Um, we are midway through that transition. And, and your evidence is what? What are you seeing as evidence of that? Nothing that I could submit to a scientific journal. You know, hold my hands out. Yeah, but we're not a scientific journal. Just, you know, that'll do. Give us what you, what is giving you cause for hope. So what's giving me cause for hope is it's a feeling. It's an intuition, if I'm really honest with myself. Um, it's paying attention to particularly like a few spiritual leaders. I'm a Sufi um, who, you know, have articulated that this is just a transition. Um, I am acutely aware that this is by no means guaranteed, but most recently, the coronavirus crisis has, it's broken that pattern of automatic behavior. Hasn't it just? It's a disruption of that, those old unconscious patterns of blind evolution have been, they've been interrupted briefly. And the entire world has been forced to take stock of what we're doing and who we are in a way that we don't have the time to do when we're all running around looking at our, you know, like we're, we're worried about our, you know, our jobs and our mortgages, etc. Yeah. So that moment, that that moment where suddenly we all take stock of ourselves, we've suddenly become slightly more aware of what we're doing, and you start to question those patterns because you've got a little bit of distance between yourself and them. Um. So all sorts of people are finding new ways of doing things. So that little cessation that gives me a little bit of hope even though it's obviously, it's a, it's a convulsion, you know, the earth is convulsing. It's a kind of, um, it's a sort of, it's a sort of spasm, isn't it? It's a cry mm. for help mm. from the natural world. Um, and, you know, I think those will get sharper. Those slaps in the face will get sharper unless we manage to transition. And do you think, hang on, just let's, since, because one of the things that strikes me when I read John Stewart's work is there's a kind of implicit teleology to it, while at the same time, quite stridently suggesting that there is no teleology, that this is an intrinsic property of the evolution of consciousness and there's no external force creating this happening. It, it is the rock that's been pushed down the hill and it will continue to go downwards unless we you know, explode the rock out of all existence by crashing ourselves into extinction. And yet, I wonder within the, the worldview, I don't know to what extent you buy into John Stewart's worldview, but from that very materialist, reductionist worldview, would the virus be seen as an implicit property of an evolutionary process? Or is it a kind of a genuine black swan that has arrived out of nowhere? Because it does seem to me that, that this is giving us the most extraordinary capacity to stop and reevaluate what we're about. And yet, it would, unless we subscribe to some of the more wild conspiracy theories, and I, I don't particularly want to go down that rabbit hole. This is, you know, this is not something that somebody has <laughs> structured as a deliberate part of a conscious evolutionary process. So, where do you stand in terms of the potential of the virus being an accident or being an intrinsic part of an ongoing process? I personally am more spiritually inclined than John. Um, so I believe that there is both a push and a pull in the evolutionary process. I believe that up till now, largely cosmological, biological even has been push. It's been an automatic, inexorable process. Um, but I believe that through us, it has the potential to transition to a teleological process, that the best of the universe's purposes really are the best of our purposes. Um, and the things that we find meaningful and are drawn to individually, collectively as a species, turn out to be the things um, that will allow those trajectories that I've described to continue. So that's that's a large part of what my podcast is about, is mm. what do humans find most meaningful? 
Um, and how do they fit into the evolutionary picture at large? Well, it turns out, if you look at the psychological data, the things that we find meaningful are things like cooperation, things like creativity, things like transcending our limitations, going beyond what we've done before. And those three things are inherently evolutionary. Um, so the virus may be um, an automatic, you know, or, or rather just a random sort of chaotic manifestation of, of life doing what it does. Um, but how we respond to that and whether we use that as a trigger to transition from blind, unconscious evolution driven by our evolutionary past to transitioning to awake, conscious evolution drawn by our visions of a better future, um, that's down to us. It would just be interesting to see what um, what John would say about that. I mean, John, John has taken great pains to state his theories in such a way that they are acceptable to scientific mainstream. That's sort of been his objective. You know, he's a scientist by by discipline. And and has that worked? Mm, it's getting there. Okay. It is getting there. I did see some articles in uh, This View of Life is a mainstream evolutionary sort of publication by um, David Sloan Wilson. And, and they're starting to consider the idea of conscious evolution. Um, I think the problem that John and I have run up against when trying to convey this worldview to people is that it basically requires the ability to think in complex adaptive systems. You have to be able to think not only about systems, but between systems. Yeah. Because the trajectories that I'm describing operate on the physical, the yes. biological and the cultural level. And people have a really difficult time conceptualizing that as one process, let alone how our actions as individuals um, feed into that and can actually cause the evolutionary process itself to evolve. You know, people find those things really hard to think about. Like the evolutionary process is is one thing. And and actually what I found really incredible describing this is how few people actually understand even what biological evolution is and actually how it works. And so the, the ability to read all of that process as one thing and to see how our actions can influence it actually requires a kind of uh, cognitive capacity which not that many people have, which I'm aware sounds sort of quite patronizing, but nonetheless, that seems to be the case. You know, you can have brilliant genius people who their level of development is still at the analytic rational level. That's the that's the level that was given birth to in the historical enlightenment, which yes. breaks things into their parts and see how those parts interrelate and can make predictions based on that. And it's incredibly powerful that, you know, it's given birth to all the technology and science that we see around us. Um, but that mode of cognition, that way of working out problems is totally incapable of dealing with complex systems because that, that mode of cognition tries to keep everything the same, alter one part and see how that affects the rest of the system. But the, with complex adaptive systems, you know, my realization about the complex adaptive system itself changes the system. So you can't keep anything the same. You can't hold all the parts in the same place and just alter one because everything is adapting to everything else. And and my my perceptions, my thoughts, my feelings, my understanding, the way I talk about this process affects the process itself. I mean, that's what you and I are doing right now, aren't we? We're having a discussion about the evolutionary process in order to try and change the evolutionary process. So ra analytic rational cognition quickly breaks down when you're dealing with complex systems. And that's, I think, why it's taken so long to filter through to the scientific mainstream. Yes, yes. Okay, I've been reading uh, The Listening Society by Hansi Freinacht. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he's laying out a metamodern, he's particularly looking at a metamodern guide to politics, but in order to get there, he's had to really break down the flow of human developmental stages. And, and, and he has managed to articulate for me the real problem that I have with a lot of Ken Wilber's work, which is that it crushes all things together, whereas Farnacht has them, he, he divides things into the complexity of our thinking, the code, which is, is the kind of social code that we have downloaded, the state, which is more of a spiritual capacity, and the depth, which is our ability to interrelate all of those with our own experience and the range of our experience and that you need all four of those to really begin to work out where you are in the world and and the interesting thing is that without becoming hierarchical it is the case that a great many people are still in what he calls the post faustian concept of the world and it is almost physiologically impossible if that is your worldview for you to take on board 
things at a higher structural complexity. But what seems to me is that, particularly now, I don't know if you're familiar with what Jamie vile has been doing, but he's been looking at self-organising communication interfaces. And even before the virus hit, he was doing calculations, working out that we were at two orders of magnitude more complex than we had ever been before at the end of 2019. And I don't know about you, but my level of uh, self-organising complexity has massively increased in the last three weeks. And I would suggest we're at <laughs> at least an order of magnitude higher than we were a month ago. And that therefore, if evolution, as you say, is this organisation of complexity and self-aware complexity, then by the act of doing what you and I are doing, by the act of the people who listen to these podcasts being able to integrate this and then disseminate it, we are creating a self-organising network of the people who can get this and do get this as we speak, which seems to me quite, quite exciting if it works. And that that links a lot to your question earlier. You know, you say, what gives me hope? Mm. Well, there, this emerging space, this emerging worldview that, that we're participating in. And, you know, I know you had um, Daniel Thorson from the Emerge podcast and Rebel Wisdom and, and the traction that some of those platforms and some of those speakers have been getting. Yeah. Um, that, that also gives me a great deal of hope. Um, you, you asked earlier as well, um, and I didn't quite get around to it, how, how we can, you know, help bring about this transition. Yes, that was, that was my next big question. That's, let's go down that as, a, as an avenue. Thank you. Great. Um, so there's individual ways that we can um, that we can enact the shift to conscious evolution, um, and there's collective ways that we need to do it. So one of them, on an individual level, one of them we've already talked about, it's, it's developing and training the cognitive capacity to read complex adaptive systems, um, which, which you know, can be done. I've done it in schools, in, with, with workshops, with kids. It's something that you can train. A very important component as an individual is increasing our self-awareness. So like we talked about, um, if you want to change your patterns of behavior to not just be conditioned and programmed by your biological and cultural past, um, then you have to develop your self-awareness. Um, the more self-aware we are, the more conscious we are, the more adaptable we are as individuals and the more adaptable we are as individuals, the more adaptable we are as a species and the more likely we are to survive. Can we un unpick that a little bit more deeply? Because this for me is one of the places where the manifesto falls down somewhat because I think that's an absolutely brilliant theory and I'm struggling on occasion to see it play out in practice. So my I would love this to be the case. And part of the accidental God's thesis is that we need to become more self-aware, but I'm not sure. So I look around at really quite a lot of the people who would be considered ascended masters of spiritual systems. And, and I have listened to Daniel Thorson's Emerge podcast on exactly this topic. A, a really quite distressingly large number of them end up in trouble because they have either sexually or emotionally abuse their followers and or they are embezzling the funds. And these people are extraordinarily capable of really deep aspects of the meditative process, however we define that. It doesn't seem to have unhinged their primal drives, which are for power over, manifested either sexually, emotionally or financially. And much as I would like that not to be the case, I think that there must be another step that we need to take. And I wonder what your, if you have a, a view of what that other step might be. Yeah, well, Ken Wilbur um, talks about um, there's, there's waking up, which is raising our awareness, but that's only one part of the puzzle. And he specifically invokes the example that you use of the guru that abuses their power sexually um, because they haven't taken care of the other lines of development of an individual, namely cleaning up, taking care of your shadow material, um, your trauma, etc. cetera, um, but also growing up, which is... Um, uh, your worldview, shifting your worldview. So, you know, it's uh, like you say, um, being enlightened isn't the only line of development. Um, it's just one of the sad truths of this complex world that it's possible to be an enlightened Buddhist monk who's also homophobic, you know, um, because your cultural worldview also shapes your behavior. 
um, not just how awake you are as an individual. Um, so, yeah. and and that um, that leads neatly actually into um, the sort of collective things that we need to do as well, because collectively we need to shift our worldview at the very least to a world centric perspective. So if we're going to form a global cooperative, which alone can resolve the issues which threaten our existence, such as climate change, such as nuclear war, then we need a center of gravity, a sufficient number of people to be, to, to view the world um, as a coherent whole. Um, and most people yes. simply uh, don't do that. They, they think of, um, they look at the world through the lens of their nation, um, and this is, it's really interesting, for example, when you talk to people about, um, who are, who are from that perspective at that level of development, when they talk about, um, the argument for nuclear weapons. So the argument goes, well, you know, we need nuclear weapons, um, to deter other countries from getting nuclear weapons. Look how well that works. Well, it's just the most extraordinary blind spot. It's like, well, okay, but take take their perspective. If if you have nuclear weapons, what are they going to want to do? You know, it's but yeah. it's most people yeah. literally don't think about it that way. They think about it from our perspective, from my nation. Yeah, well, it's also it's an amygdaloid expression that's been hung around with post hoc rationalization. That's a hell of a mouthful. It's it's it doesn't require to have any actual rational logic to it. It's just an emotional it's an out, outpouring of our amygdala. You're probably so, right. So rationality go, went out the window. You're probably right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but the encouraging thing about that is that, um, and and this is something I'm getting from Ken Wilber, but the, the, at the historical enlightenment, um, only about ten percent of people were at, um, you know, rational, orange, world centric worldview. So it doesn't require. We don't have to shift the entire global population to um, to this kind of integral, complex thinking systems level stage uh, but we just have to shift a um you know a sort of a tipping point a sort of sufficient number in order to light the touch paper and and that's what this emerging online space that we're plugged into seems to be doing it seems to be on the point of reaching a kind of uh you know getting a kind of momentum of its own and particularly as so many people collectively are searching for answers, you know, the stories that we've been living by are so obviously breaking down. And that's incredibly painful for people. But it, at the same time, people are aware that, you know, you know, a lot of people are not seeing meaning and and um, purpose in the kind of ways that we're organizing ourselves collectively. And that means that they're open to a new way of seeing the world. And that, of course, that can be for good and for bad. You know, so, I mean, extremism, for example, is, I see that as a symptom of, of um, a culture that doesn't speak to our need for meaning and purpose. Um, so, you know, young disaffected men who find life meaningless and they're told that they should go off and be a bank manager and they don't want that, you know, they're, they're, they're vulnerable and they're exposed to dangerous ideas, but also to positive, beautiful ideas, which can speak to that need for meaning and purpose. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to do with conscious evolution is really address it to people's direct need for meaning and purpose and say, hey, you know, not only is this shift to conscious evolution our only hope of surviving as a species, but also this will make you happier. You'll find your life meaningful if you, if you find your way of serving the evolutionary process. And I think that's very powerful and can't be a coincidence either that the things that we find most in meaningful as individuals are also the things that, you know, evolution requires to continue on the direction it's been going in. Yes. OK, so again, this opens so many doors. So first, I would like to look at the tipping point is obviously crucial. When Extinction Rebellion was looking at tipping points, specifically, they said that we required three and a half percent of the population, which is a, a manageable number, particularly in the UK. You can kind of define that as a number of people. But they reached that understanding by looking at the ending of slavery, women's suffrage, the gay rights movement in the America and the end of apartheid in South Africa. And in each of these cases, we were not saying we need to end the system. We were saying we need to increase the franchise of the existing system. It's explicitly neoliberal capitalism in its extractive form. We just need to give more people access to the value extraction rather than changing the nature of the value that we embody to not be extractive. 
So it seems to me that the first thing is we need a very different number in our tipping point if what we are doing is saying, guys, the system isn't working, we need to change the system. Not, we just need to let a few more people to have access to the system. And, and you know, don't worry, we won't really let them have access. We'll just pretend to let them have access. But that opens up a whole different door. Let's not go there. Sure. The second question, it's, do we, do we therefore need to reach and connect the people who, if we're going to go to Ken Wilber's system, and I really dislike Ken Wilber's system, but I like the, the waking up, the growing up, cleaning up, showing up. I don't like his the spiral dynamic colour model because I think it has huge holes in it. But if we take that as, as a model, however broken, he goes through the different colours of, of magical, mythical, traditional, postmodern, metamodern. And that those who are already in what we might call a metamodern world, where they ha are already looking for these answers and have the capacity to engage with this and to see the potential. Are we simply linking those people up with our increasing complexity of our self-organising communications? Or are we trying to reach the people who on the spiral dynamics would be at a lower turn of the spiral and raise them up? Um, so to, to that question, first of all, um, both. Um, and it seems to me that one is one is conducive to the other. Um, so, How? you know, I, I, I go into schools, I work with teenagers a lot. And, um, you know, so teenagers obviously are, you know, midway through their development. Um, they're, they're not necessarily able to bounce around the ideas that we're bouncing around right here. Um, and, you know, yet at the same time, my work helping them to you know develop their cognitive capacity to shift their worldview to become more empathetic to think in terms of systems you know that that in no way conflicts with my goal of connecting up with you and listening to the emerge podcast and developing my own cognitive capacity and creating networks in that space so i don't see them at all as um in conflict can i can i step in a bit there because i think you're right and working with sure. teenagers i would really like to believe you know we look at greta thunberg and we're completely in awe of what she does but i talk to what we might loosely call the alt right members of my extended family network and we have quite long, quite deep conversations and I reach a cognitive wall. And these are the people who have charge of the world at the moment. If we wait until the teenagers of now have the capacity to influence the power structures, my fear is extinction will have overtaken us before then. So I'm wondering, are you seeing ways of reaching those who are holding the current power structures in ways that make a difference. Right. So, so I think the alt-right and all forms of extremism are symptoms of a broken system. Um, that's people searching very, very desperately, very hard for a coherent narrative which can point to their place and purpose in the universe. Yep. Um, because our dominant culture is not meeting, is not doing that job very well. And so people look to the fringes. Um, those same... In the same way that those symptoms point to the breakdown of our larger cultural narrative and worldview, um, systemically, our may are uh, the the dominant um, way of doing things, dominant economic policy, um, dominant political theory are also unraveling at the seams. Um, so just to give you, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not um, controversial to say that. Um, MPs feel increasingly powerless. Hmm. Um, an MP is is not able to affect very much change because we're living in such a global interconnected world that the problems that a nation state deals with, um, they can't be resolved at the national level. Tell that to the Brexiteers. But yes. Well, I yeah, I know, but but listen, that that little experiment will 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 run its course and it will become quickly obvious that um you know a problem like 
inequality, for example, tax avoidance by large companies, is not going to be made easier if we're all individual competing nations. You know, each, each competing to have the lowest corporation tax. You know, you're never going to resolve inequality um, when nations compete with one another because it's that competition which um, drives, uh, you know, ever more extractive behaviours to compete for material and, um, you know, geopolitical dominance. Um, which is incidentally a game that I play with with teenagers in schools. We play a kind of game theoretical climate change game. Um, and, and a bunch of teenagers, once they've got to the end of that process, can tell you, oh, yeah, we really needed to cooperate. We really needed to work together as a globe. Um, so so that, first of all, that structure of the dominant nation state is, is self-evidently not going to work. Even people who are in charge of, you know, the, the people who supposedly have lots of power um, are beginning to realize that as well. Um, in a more systemic perspective, um, the incentive structures, so our monetary systems, are also breaking down. They're unraveling. They're not beginning. They're not working the way they used to. So, with each economic crash, the levers that are available for governments and central bankers to pull um, don't, you know, increasingly don't work. So, in the last economic crash, we dropped interest rates to, you know, zero percent even negative interest rates. Um, and still, we sort of only just managed to get the car to the top of the hill, you know. Um, in this economic crash, we, we're all, we were already at 1%. There was no further that, that could go. So the standard levers that they pull aren't working. And so what you see in the space of a month is a complete radical reinvention of monetary policy, um, talking about concepts that, you know, I have been talking about um, for years, like, you know, uh, helicopter money, just, you know, forget about creating money alongside debt um, and indebting future generations. It's, you know, quite possible for a sovereign nation to create money and spend it into the real economy, to give it to, you know, to spend it on hospitals, to give it, you know, um, in, Amer in America, they're considering a policy of just giving um, every individual $1,200. You know, that's, that's the kind of um, radical monetary system transition or, or, you know, shift, which, which, just wouldn't have been conceivable a few years ago or even one year ago. Um, and now is kind of like standard policy for the United States. So so that also, you know, even the people in charge are aware that this this whole thing isn't working. I mean, I I I I I'm I'm not I am a, a very naive perhaps. I'm quite an optimist. And I find it really hard to imagine these sort of evil puppet master scenarios with, you know, loads of men wheedling their hands over the puppet strings. Um Mostly because, um, you know, I, I know uh, a few quite influential uh, bankers who, you know, who speak to central bankers. Um, and it's not that they're, they're not bad people. So, you know, if, if these guys aren't the evil ones, then where are they exactly? Let me introduce you to Steve Bannon. But that's a whole separate conversation. Well, sure. But, you know, Steve Bannon, as I say, he's again, he's a symptom of a system that's not working. Um, and 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 and. Ideas like Brexit, that kind of divisive mentality, it's completely against the um, downward flow of evolution, like you say. So it's possible to swim upstream, but it requires extra effort to maintain that. And that it's always short lived. In the end, you're always going to get swept downstream again. So evolution is going to continue in the trajectory it's been continuing on. Um, and if the extent to which we can turn around our boat is the extent to which we'll be part of that or not. Um, but, but you know, Brexit, civil wars, um, uh, the breakup of nations, all these things happen in history, but they're not the overwhelming trajectory of evolution. And once they run their course, evolution continues on its upwards trajectory towards increasing cooperation. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And, and I don't want to get into geopolitical stuff because that's not really what this podcast, we can have another podcast talking about that. But it seems to me I absolutely take on board what you're saying. And I imagine anybody listening will do. What we have at the moment is a particular concatenation of events where we are very close, as far as we understand it, as far as the science tells us just now, if we're not already over the line into irreversible tipping points in terms of both climate and destruction of the biosphere, we are within probably single digits, if not very small double digits, of reaching those tipping points. And therefore, we haven't really got the time for the cultural, the kind of sine wave of cultural evolution where a little bit of progress is made, one step forward, two steps back, and eventually, you know, you reach a point where 
I don't know, women have the vote and, and gay people are not being burned at the stake. We haven't got time for the breakdown of nations to happen if we're going to work as a global cooperative towards averting climate change and tipping points. And I wonder, and this may be unanswerable, so, so I have another double question, and one is, are you seeing actual worldwide change that would give reason for optimism that we could get ourselves into a global cooperative state before we hit the tipping points? And now let's answer that one, because then I have a second question, which is quite a big one and will probably be the last one. So are you seeing any any hope on that one? So the the change, the radical change that's needed and the speed that at which it's needed um, it is never going to come from the top. The, what I was saying with my earlier point is that they themselves, even people at the top, are beginning to realise that what they're doing isn't working. So that, you know, there is this kind of potential there um, that, that, that even the people who this system is supposedly working for are beginning to realise it's not working. And are they coming to you for an alternative narrative? <laughs> No, I'm or just to the people chasing within. them down the street with placards, <laughs> <laughs> which, of course, we know is the right way to target someone. Um, but frankly, I have had uh, conversations with um, you know very influential bankers right at the top of the pyramid okay. who are open to ideas of uh, monetary system change. I, I've 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 heard somebody who is chairman of a major um, investment bank, which you would know, and I won't name. Um, who who was literally mooting the possibility of a debt jubilee, and that was before the coronavirus crisis. So it's it's, it's okay. the, the ideas are circulating even in the even in those circles. Yeah, and I think their children are beginning to have an impact on them, which is also useful. Absolutely you may have spot on. spoken to their kids, and it's working working. Uh, well, uh, that's the dream. Um, that said, you know the impetus is going to come from all levels. It's not going to come from the top. It's not going to come from the bottom. It's going to come from all levels simultaneously. Um, so, yes, I am seeing signs of that. Um, I'm seeing, just to give a couple of really micro examples, because of coronavirus, um, we decided to pop round. We live in the most antisocial village in the UK. It, it, there is no pub, there's no church, there's no post office, there's no community sense at all. Um, and because of the crisis, we decided to uh, go around everyone's front door and create a WhatsApp group just in case anyone was isolating at home yep. and was elderly and didn't have access to food. As a result of that, we have now uh, set up collectively, organised, you know, I didn't do this, I just set up the group, but people on the group have organised a weekly delivery of vegetables, um, a fishmonger who comes once a week to deliver fish to all of us, um, we've been getting mm -hmm. out into the streets on a daily basis to say hello to each other. I know everyone's names. I didn't know people's names before. Um, okay, there's also been an endless slurry of incredibly unfunny memes. Um, but, you know, and, and just think about that happening on, on the scale of one little village and thinking how many different places that will be happening. At the same time as that's happening, as people are organising collectively, there's a lot more integration going on, that, to use the technical, you know, Ken Wilber-esque term. That's, that's the integration taking place. Um, at the same time, the entire world's attention is in one place. And collectively, we are putting in place shifts um, and, and shifts to our institutions, whether it's hospitals, whether it's government, whether it's economic policy, um, that were unthinkable um, a few months ago. And the speed at which we're doing them is forcing us to acknowledge that actually we can transition unbelievably quickly. We, are, we can't ignore that fact that we are actually capable. The excuses of like, oh, it's not possible, aren't going to wash anymore. Collectively, we know what we're capable of. Mm. And that, that makes that opens up a huge window of the adjacent possible. Yes. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Um, I, I, that's just my nature. Um, and I think, you know, put it this way, even if you're at the bottom of a dark cave and there's only one tiny chink of light uh, that you can see above you... It's still worth looking at the light. That's where you go, Exactly. That's the direction that you go in. Yeah. And I heard Emily Maitlis say on Newsnight the other night that this is a health problem with social implications and a social problem with health implications. 
And I genuinely thought that it was a spoof and someone had overdubbed it because I didn't believe <laughs> that that could possibly have come out of the mouths of a senior BBC operative. Right, right. And apparently it did. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was utterly gobsmacked. So um, I've got dopamine versus serotonin written in large red letters on my pad here, but I don't think we have time for that. But underneath it, in equally large, equally red letters, I have narrative. Mm. And this is, I think we need to finish soon because we've, it's going to be quite a long podcast. But I would really be interested in how you are disseminating a new narrative or how we could, because I have been speaking to everybody that I know who is involved in the television industry, which after 20 years of writing novels is quite a lot, saying we have the old narrative. We have the, the if we get it wrong, we have Mad Max, we have 28 Days Later, we have Handmaid's Tale, whatever. We have patterns of how things could go badly wrong and we know them backwards. We have very, very few, if any, narrative arcs of what happens if we actually got it all right from here on in. What happens if we were able to be cooperative, creative, conducive in the ways that you're describing? And I am running up against really quite large conceptual blocks of people going, yeah, but who would want to watch that? It, it wouldn't be very interesting, would it? There's no, there's no, uh, you know, no, no, nothing to really hook a narrative on. And I... I'm obviously not explaining it well because I I kind of sit there with slack jawed going I I I think there would actually I don't I don't think this would be baskets of kittens and roses overnight you know I think Monsanto might still be fighting a last ditch gasp to contaminate the entire planet um how are you managing to create a new narrative and spread it so first of all I think it's important to say that the 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 past is always likely to be a more powerful influencing factor on people than the future because it's something that's happened. Yeah, we know it. It's something that's real. <laughs> yeah. It's it's in their DNA. It's programming their behavior. You know, they're conditioned by their childhood, by their upbringing, by their culture, etc. So that that is a very it's a very powerful anchor. And 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 it's not it's, we don't want to disregard all of that. That's important. Um, but imagining a better future and transitioning to an evolution which is primarily driven by our own visions of a better future, is 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 a big ask. Um, so first of all, you know, be patient with people. It's not it's not easy thing to do. Um, and and you know, a lot of people their past is not as. Um, well, people have trauma and stuff that they have to deal with, and 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 that that makes it a lot harder to shed the conditioning of the past, um, individually and collectively, of course. Um, the way that I'm primarily speaking to people, or or trying to, um, trying to get to the heart of something that people themselves know that they actually want, is through meaning. Because you don't have to be a systems thinker or a uh, a Buddhist monk t to know if you're unhappy. Hmm. And the mental health crisis is, above all, a crisis of meaning. And the psychological data is there to back up that claim. Um, people who report finding their lives meaningless are far more likely to commit suicide um, they're far less likely to be healthy um, and a whole range of other, you know, factors come with that. And so primarily I'm positioning my work, my podcast, as speaking to that fundamental need that we all have for meaning and purpose, um, which, which, which is a need that, you know, is increasingly prescient as we improve our material living conditions. You know, so Abraham Maslow was a psychologist who said that, you know, we have these developmental needs mm. and at the top of that is this need to self-actualize. Well, that's a need that you can only really feel keenly if you've had the bottom half of the pyramid, those needs met and met comfortably. Yeah. Um, and that's what we find as, 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 a, as, a, as a species, we've got better and better at meeting our material living conditions, particularly in the West. We find more and more people are popping up into that top space of needing to find meaning and purpose. And that void used to be met and met squarely by religion. So religion, say what you like about it, organized religion was incredibly good at providing us with a narrative and a story which, A, 
binds us together in tight social organization um, and, and allows us to cooperate at a scale that we couldn't without those narratives. And B, meets that need that we all have for meaning and purpose. It says very clearly who we are, where we've come from, and what our purpose is in the unfolding of the universe. Yeah. So with the historical enlightenment and the birth of reason, obviously that story was critiqued and critiqued very effectively. And so while that was a great leap forward in terms of, um, you know, in evolutionary terms, that was a great leap forward. It uh, unleashed um, a great vast reserve of creativity and um, technological growth and, and you know, cultural um, art and culture and science and all the rest of it. Um, it at the same time, it left a void. And it left a void um, of a narrative of, of, of meaning. And so what conscious evolution is, is a new narrative uh, which explains who we are, where we've come from, can point to our place and purpose in the universe, but at the same time can withstand rational scrutiny. And it's very important that it, it's able to do that. But at the same time, it needs to speak to that deep need we all have for meaning and purpose. And... Um, so my sort of challenge is try it for yourself. Um, you know, listen to my podcast when it comes out um, and which, you know, you can find out when that's coming out on consciousevolution.co.uk. Yeah, we'll, we'll flag it, don't worry. Wonderful. Um, and, you know, find your way of being part of that process. Whatever it is, um, whether it's, you're a you know, person who's inherently creative, uh, maybe, you know, you're a cooperative person, maybe you're someone who... Um, volunteers in a care home and works for charity, um, whatever it is, or, or, you know, perhaps you're more drawn to the transcendent aspect, but whatever it is, the thing that you love doing, the thing that you, that makes you feel good above all else, that will be your way of contributing to the evolutionary process. And that will provide your life with meaning and purpose as well. Brilliant. There was one other, I was, there was one other piece I was going to say. Okay, go on. But it was just about, um, the fact that because we're at the global level, cooperation won't happen without our conscious intention. Yes. It's just that piece of the puzzle is that because there's no outgroup to drive the emergence of global cooperation, we will not achieve glo global cooperation without conscious evolution. It requires a, a pull rather than a push. It won't happen from a push process. Yeah. Yes, no, I think you're right. Okay, so we always end with some quick fire questions. And the first one is, what books would you recommend that people could read or if you would rather refer them to a website they will already consciousevolution.co.uk will be linked <laughs> on the show notes is there any any reading if people are interested and want to find more depth of this uh robert piercig who wrote zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance um that's the very famous one his second book in particular is called leela um and in it he draws a parallel between evolution and also the uh, the Chinese concept of Tao in Chinese philosophy and how, in fact, they're the same process at work. Um, so that was a massive influence on me. I loved that book. Yeah, I'll, st I'll stick with just that. Okay. Any podcast other than yours and ours that you'd recommend that people listen to? Um, probably podcasts that you've mentioned a lot, the Emerge podcast, Future Thinkers. Um, I like Charles Eisenstein's podcast. It's called A New and Ancient Story. Um, obviously, quite on like similar points that we're making in, that, in those terms. Um, yeah, those three. Brilliant. Well, Rob, thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting. I would definitely like to invite you back again for another chat, some point when we both have a space in our schedules. I don't know about you, but life has got massively busier in the last three weeks when we're supposed to be in lockdown, <laughs> um, just because there's so much else that we can be doing online. So thank you hugely. I hope you continue to have... A privileged and wonderful time in the village. <laughs> and not feel too guilty about it. <laughs> uh, no, don't feel guilty. Just carry on doing good stuff. And when your podcast comes out, let me know and I will make sure that we flag it up. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. It's such a it's such a relief almost to find someone else who's talking about conscious evolution. It makes me feel like I'm not the last Willy Mammoth after all. So Definitely not. Thank you. And um, yeah, and good luck. Thank you. So that's it for another week. Thanks to Caro C for the music at the head and foot of the podcast, and for the sound production. And thanks to Faith Tilleray for designing the website and for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods. If you want to visit the website, we're at accidentalgods.life. You'll find the show notes there, and a blog, 
and other podcasts, and the outline of how I think we're going to get to conscious evolution. Because I take on board everything that Rob has said, that's why we had him on here to interview. But I think that we need to make this a co-creation. Because we're not the only part of the web of consciousness, the web of life. We might be a key part. We're definitely a creative, hyper-complex, highly connected part. And we have a role to play. But for me, we need to make the leap to reconnect with the rest of the more-than-human world. We need to find a way to stand in our power, heart open, heart full, and ask, what do you want of me, of the greater world, in a way that lets us hear answers that are not touched by our egos or our fears, and that takes practice. But it is possible. We need to know, all of us, all of you out there listening, that we can do this. It doesn't take a lifetime spent meditating or some kind of arcane knowledge. The path is there. It's open and it's ready and waiting. And what we're finding with people who join our membership program is that if you're given a structure, if you're given meditations and visualizations that lead you step by step into that kind of connection, then life does become richer. It becomes more heartfelt. You find you have agency and meaning and a sense of connectedness that grows day by day. So the membership portal is there at accidentalgods.life on the web. We're at accidental underscore gods on Instagram and accidentalgods.life on Facebook. So come along and find us. Come and join us. It's a pound for the first two weeks. And if you're anywhere else in the world with the pound tanking the way it is, that's probably about 10 cents. So come on in. Come and join us. See how it works for you. And as far as the podcast goes, if you like what you hear, please do subscribe. It lets us know that you're there. Five stars and a review lets Google know that we're there. And if you like what you hear, please do share it. The way we are going to spread is by word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell your family, send the link to anybody that you think wants to feel more agency wants to feel that their life has real, core, grounded meaning. So that's it. See you again next week. Thank you and goodbye.